In the late 60s and early 70s, the United States government went on a bit of a safety crusade. A crusade that fundamentally altered all of our relationship with cars and led to the advent of modern safety regulations, some of which we very much owe our lives to. But at its height, it had some curious effects, radically altering and arguably worsening some period models. So today on TwinCam, we're talking about the rumour that the United States was going to ban convertibles. Vehicle safety is something we rather take for granted today, but back in the 1950s it might as well have not existed. The legislation that cars all over the world had to meet wasn't all that much more than lights, indicators and number plates. In fact, the big and flashy new safety system was the three-point seatbelt, which became mandatory fitment to British market cars in 1965, though it would take another 18 years for them to become compulsory to wear. But I'm sure you're wondering why I'm talking about Britain when the topic is the United States. And the answer is simple. For starters, guess where I'm from. But more importantly, what was about to happen wouldn't affect just the US, but would fundamentally change the global motor industry. Now this isn't to say that the US was the only driver of safety standards, as manufacturers themselves had started to take some steps. But with a relative lack of attention from governments, the industry was becoming a little lopsided. To show you what I mean, I have two examples to show, and yes, they're both British, but I'm using them purely because I know them, and as both were exported to the US, the point stands up. The first is one I always seem to come back to, the Mini. This little fellow was designed by a man named Alec Izagonis, and his philosophy on safety fell firmly into the preventative camp. Isagonis designed the Mini with front-wheel drive and fully independent suspension, both things that weren't common at all in 1959, and to further the point, the front was by double wishbones and the rear by semi-trailing arms, gifting the Mini tremendous geometry and handling. Isagonis also believed in keeping the driver alert, so the seats were purposefully upright and there was no provision for a radio. However, the man was also a chain smoker, so we'll put the four ashtrays he installed down as a product of their time. <laughs> Regardless, the Mini was, theoretically, less likely to be in a crash than most of the cars. But if it did end up in a crash, its goal was to kill all its occupants. In a Mini, the doors fling open as the latches are just like the ones in your house. The steering column acts as a spear to go through your neck, and if you thought your knees were safe, then all that lovely bone and tendon acts as the crumple zone. And let's just hope a Mini never rolls over, because the fuel filler neck protrudes and is placed in exactly the worst spot, right in the corner. But fortunately, the rear lamp cluster is right next to it, so all the fuel will disappear as it burns. But I don't want any of you to think that I'm being too harsh on the Mini. It's just one example I'm picking out because it does prevention brilliantly and protection appallingly. Most cars of the period happen to do both things badly, so there's something of a defence. On the other hand, only down the road from Austin was Rover, who in 1963 debuted the Rover 2000, the car we know retrospectively as the Rover P6. This car essentially created the compact executive market, but that's a story for another day. What matters here is that the Rover was designed by a man named Spen King, and it was engineered to save your life. Just as Mercedes-Benz became famous for, Rover had brought us a car brimming with technology. Just like the Mini, it was also designed not to crash in the first place, with four-wheel disc brakes, a sophisticated coil-sprung front suspension, and a De Dion tube at the back, along with little markers on the wings to ensure you wouldn't bump into other cars while parking. But let's say you did crash at speed. All P6s had front seat belts as standard, but they also had mountings for rear belts, something the UK government would take a further 23 years to make compulsory to wear. But even if you weren't wearing them, the Rover's interior was furnished only with soft materials, even the window winders being designed to collapse under impact. Of course, there were properly engineered and tested crumple zones, a collapsible steering column, and even a power unit designed to slide under the body. 
The fuel tank was above and in front of the rear axle, stopping it from being punctured, and even the P6's base unit construction was there for safety, helping dissipate crash forces around the cabin rather than through it. Now, Rover were not the first to do any of these, but the P6 proves that the global motor industry was very capable of producing safer vehicles, but was rather choosing not to. Undoubtedly, cost did play a role, but if we hop over to the United States, that was less of an issue than it was in Europe, and with their approach to motoring ingrained in the society, the federal government was eventually forced into action. The problem with the United States was that, thanks to their consumerist and Cold War-driven approach to motoring, their manufacturers were used to very quick turnarounds, as well as luxury dictated by flashiness and very high levels of equipment. In fact, you could take the average American car of the period, and in terms of equipment, it would wipe the floor with the average European car. However, the immense consumerism and quick turnarounds adversely affected both engineering and safety. While it would be stupid to say that all American cars were the same, they weren't building anything remotely like the Rover P6, and two years after that car's launch, all hell broke loose across the Atlantic. It all began thanks to a chap named Ralph Nader, who published a book in 1965 titled Unsafe at Any Speed. This book was massively important to the American motor industry because it changed the way they approached car design, showing them the virtues of decent suspension, efficient engines, pedestrian safety, soft interiors, seat belts, all the kinds of things that we take for granted today but it also made examples of cars that did things wrong. This is why the Ford Pinto is so famous for its rear-mounted fuel tank, in spite of hundreds of other cars doing the same thing, but it was pinpointed. And with this kind of attention, you can absolutely see why so much attention was suddenly placed on rollovers. Before we get there, however, Unsafe at any speed caused Americans to have discussions they'd never had before, and in such a litigious society, opened the floodgates for manufacturers to take the blame. This shift in attitudes opened up the likes of the recall system, as well as introducing the first federal safety standards for passenger cars. Again, we'll get to that shortly, but for now, Nader's book made examples of particular models, and while the Pinto is another car that would, fairly or unfairly, become famous in the 1970s, back in 1965, Unsafe made an example of one particular car, the Chevrolet Corvair. In fact, the Corvair was the car that kick-started Nader's research as it was becoming legal baggage for General Motors, and its mechanical layout made it an outlier when compared to the majority. The first-generation Corvair ran between 1959 and 1964, so it was out of production by the time the book was published, but regardless, it was still a modern car, and what made it different was the fact it featured a rear-mounted flat six, combined with swing axle suspension. And this basic reality made its handling… interesting, shall we say. The nature of a rear-engine layout is that all the weight is behind the rear axle, which while helping traction, can act as a pendulum if you can't control it properly. This wasn't much of an issue in low-powered cars like the Volkswagen Beetle, but if we up the stakes to a Porsche 911, then I'm sure we've all heard the stories. It took Stuttgart decades to finally get it right, because the weight imbalance is one mighty Achilles heel, and when combined with swing axles, things can get sketchy. Swing axles are only ever fitted to cars because of their simplicity, and they work by having a universal joint at the differential, then a solid connection between the half shafts and hubs, effectively defeating the point of having suspension in the first place, because any decent suspension travel leads to immense changes in the camber angles of the road wheels. Now, various components were designed into the Corvair to try and prevent this, and in US government tests, they found it to be no worse on the limit than many of its contemporaries. But the simple fact is that swing axles can lead to truly bipolar handling, 
As with the Pinto's rear-mounted fuel tank, however, the Corvair wasn't alone. The aforementioned Beetle had swing axles too, but Nader chose it as his example, just as I did with the Mini. The problem General Motors had, however, was the fact that they had over 100 pending lawsuits regarding crashes involving Corvairs. As I said, litigious. Unsafe at any speed highlighted the fact that safety was being purposefully ignored for the sake of cost, and GM's actions following the book's publication says a lot about their thoughts. But while the Corvair was made an example of and the nation collectively gasped, flaws had been exposed across the motor industry, and a serious amount of time, money and research was now being funneled into vehicle safety. In 1966, the federal government passed the National Traffic and Motor Vehicle Safety Act, which allowed government to set new and serious design standards for the first time. But as with many things government does, it went a little bit mad. Nader's book inadvertently making cars arguably worse, for a little while at least. But here's where we come back to Europe. Because while the US Big Three generally stayed within their own borders, the likes of MG and Triumph sold more cars across the Atlantic than they did back home in the UK, which meant legislation really mattered to them. As I mentioned earlier on, everything was now on the agenda, and with convertibles as an easy target, it's not difficult to see why many European manufacturers suddenly became very nervous when designing new cars. It goes without saying that the problem was the risk of rollovers, so manufacturers worked out that they could design cars that were both more rigid and visibly safer by retaining at least two rollover bars, one atop the windscreen and another behind. Naturally, this led to Targa and T-tops, which had existed for many years prior, but now gained in popularity. Undoubtedly, the most famous example is the Porsche 911 Targa, which was launched in 1967, but whose design predated Ralph Nader's book, so it was purely good timing for Porsche. However, other manufacturers quickly began abandoning traditional convertibles, and Porsche's 914 was launched in 1969 only as a Targa. Ferrari would join the party in 71, but the mainstream market would eventually catch up with Fiat making their new X19 a Targa, as opposed to the full convertible of both its predecessor and its bigger brother. However, for some manufacturers, things weren't quite so easy. The Dino, for example, was a spider version of an existing car, and while the Fiat X19 may have been new, its mechanical components were lifted straight from the existing Fiat 128. But the car I've been using as my prop is the Triumph Stag, whose development began all the way back in 1964, and wound up being lumbered with this slightly clumsy T-bar in order to protect its occupants. So that's how we wound up here. The Triumph Stag I'm using as my prop is probably a bad example because its T-bar wasn't really here for rollover safety. It was there mainly to stop it falling in half. But British Leyland considered it a happy accident that it was future-proofed in the process. However, it meant that this car's silhouette was fundamentally compromised, undoubtedly taking away a little bit of the desirability it would have had had it been a full convertible. But this wasn't even the worst affected triumph. The original Stag concept was a full convertible, but a mixture of rigidity concerns and what was happening overseas led it to be born in this form. After all, and as I mentioned, Triumph was selling more cars in America than it was in the UK, so legality had to be at the top of the agenda, and this would fundamentally shape their next sports car. When coming up with a joint MGB and Triumph TR6 replacement, British Leyland sent a team to the United States for the sake of market research and found that a coupe would probably be the best option. The Triumph TR7 would launch in the US at the end of 1974 and was found all over the world to not quite hit the mark. The car's styling, performance and reliability were all suspect, but the lack of a convertible was seen as a serious compromise by many. While the US was falling out of love with convertibles anyway, as we'll get to, 
it paled in comparison to an open-top MG or TR6. Eventually, British Leyland relented, and a TR7 convertible was finally launched in 1979, just two years before the company's woes forced it out of production. But barring the TR7, the European motor industry was quite inventive when it came to ensuring their convertibles could withstand any future legislation, but the American industry never bothered to do this. You see, even if they were banned in the US, they'd still have been perfectly legal in Europe, and manufacturers weren't about to give up on the genre. After all, Mercedes-Benz engineered two distinct variants of their 107 generation SL, a standard convertible and the SLC. The idea was that if such a ban had been enforced, then they could sell the SLC in the United States and the proper SL in Europe. In the meantime, it made a bit of sense to make two cars, as the coupe was really rather different, complete with four seats. In the event, the SLC was killed off in 1981, as it became clear that such a ban was never going to happen, and it was replaced by a conventional S-Class coupe, while the convertible SL soldiered on through to 1989. As you may have gathered by now though, legislation to these lengths never came to pass. But the actions of all these major manufacturers tells us how fluid the situation was and how, at the click of your fingers, the federal government could have legislated against them. Presenting us with the perfect example of this are a pair of British Leyland's other sports cars, the MG Midget and MGB, which continue to be built alongside the TR7 through to 1980, but from 74 they were required to meet new pedestrian safety standards. Back at home, British Leyland had a full pedestrian safety program in the works, but as a quick fix for two aging cars, they were simply converted to meet the wording of the law, most definitely making them worse. Both had their suspensions raised, ruining their handling, and they were fitted with squishy black plastic bumpers, which were ugly, but meant you could hit things at 5 miles per hour if you weren't a very good driver. New bumpers and raised suspension are easy things for a manufacturer to fit on a whim, and we saw that all the way through the 70s and 80s with a variety of European cars, but imagine the chaos if manufacturers hadn't planned for a possible convertible ban. In this respect, it's easy for us to laugh at history, but I wanted to talk about the context and all the surrounding story leading to this era, because to simply laugh at history is to forget why we got there. The legislation put in place in the 70s really wasn't perfect, but it was the first really notable vehicle safety legislation, and it paved the way for motoring today. But on the other side of the discussion, we have the American manufacturers, who just didn't bother developing any new cars. There are a range of possible reasons for this, but the dating is far too much of a coincidence to ignore. The last American convertible was the Cadillac Eldorado, which was killed off in 76, and it would be a fair few years before the fear had subsided and convertibles made a comeback. However, it wasn't just the law that the American manufacturers were scared of. Probably because of the national discussion surrounding safety, sales of homegrown convertibles went into freefall, convertible Mustang sales collapsing from nearly 23% of total production in 1965 to less than 4% in 1973. A similar pattern was found elsewhere, with convertible Corvette sales falling from 65% to 12% between 1968 and 1975. However, this latter example may be a red herring, as anticipating what the Europeans did, Chevrolet developed a T-top Corvette in 1968. Regardless, for a good decade or so, convertibles became relatively rare in the United States, and as a result, it affected car manufacturers from all over the world. So that's the story of how the US could well have banned the sale of convertible cars and how, in the process, manufacturers tried to sidestep lawmakers with some interesting compromises and others that totally misread the market.
But with that, thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, then please do click like and subscribe to TwinCam as well. I'm forever indebted to my wonderful Patreon supporters, so if you'd like to support me that way, then please do follow the link in the description. And I'll have more videos coming along soon.